I'm very pleased to announce our, to introduce our second speaker, Mike, Roberts, Mike Robertson. Mike is an award-winning professional speaker, writer, musician, and storyteller. His entertaining and inspiring presentations on the subject of creativity and the use of technology as a vehicle to display creativity have been enjoyed by thousands. His presentations are also famous for their artistic and surprising visuals, which he creates to accompany his words. The design of these items owes more, much to over 20 years of experience as a professional graphic designer. Mike is the author of four books and lives in Austin, which he describes as the most California-like city in Texas. <laughs> Mike does his fair share of helping to keep Austin weird. He subscribes wholeheartedly to the philosophy espoused by Rosalind Russell and Auntie Mame. Life is a banquet and most poor suckers are starving to death. Please join me in welcoming Mike Robertson. Thank you, Ben. Well, where I live, we say howdy. So howdy from Austin. Uh, what, what Ben said is true. Austin is the most California-like place in Texas. It's becoming that way more all the time. And it's not just the good stuff. We're also getting things like traffic and drought and earthquakes now. <laughs> We're also getting a whole lot of Californians. So come on, there's room for everybody. Uh, today I want to talk to you. I usually use one screen when I present, and you'll see why. Today I'm going to leave them both on, but there will be various times when I will ask you to focus on one screen uh, instead of both at once. And I will try to move around to make that more interesting for you. But we're here today to talk about technology. Technology. We live in an awesome time when technology is so much a part of our lives that it's the first thing we reach for in the morning. It's the last thing we put down at night. It's something we use hundreds of times per day. Yet, if you go back and look at the root word of technology, the Greek root word, it has to do with art and skill. And even there's a sense of almost sleight of hand, of, of doing cunning things with your hands. But today, we most often tend to think of technology as just a, a push button to help us do something easily, a, a labor-saving device that we just flip a switch and it does something we want to happen. But I think we sell ourselves short when we think of technology that way. Technology is really just a tool. And like any tool, it can be used for mundane purposes or it can be used for things that are awesome and life-changing. The highest, the highest goal of any tool is to be used to enrich, to engage, to enhance the life of another human being. When we can find a tool that we can use that attracts the, the attention, it can be used to bring light, but it can also be used to bring enlightenment. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. How can we use technology to engage our audience? Not just to say, here's a bunch of information, look at it. But to engage them and say, wow, I want more of that stuff. When, when Thomas Edison invented the technology to produce motion pictures, you may not be aware of this. He created the movie camera, and he looked at this invention and he said, I don't believe there is any significant commercial use for this technology. <laughs> Did you know that? Did you know that Hollywood exists for people who were running away from Thomas Edison and his lawyers back east? They wanted to use his technology without having to pay him a royalty, so they came as far away from New Jersey as they could get and where the weather was better, and that's why Hollywood is here and not in Edison's backyard. He couldn't see much use for the movie camera. In fact, the best thing he could come up with was a wooden box that you could drop a nickel into and one person could look through a little viewer and watch 30 seconds of film go by. The technology was there, but it was missing the creativity that would take it to a higher level. It took a whole different 
group of people to come up with the idea of, you know, if we take that same film and we projected it on a wall, we could charge 200 people a nickel at a time to watch it. The technology really hasn't changed very much from that first movie camera. But it took somebody to come up with a creative idea on a new way to use it. Takes it to a whole different level. I, technology is, uh, is often only half of a solution. The other half is always found by a person with vision, a creative thinker, uh, somebody who sees technology as a stepping stone to reach a new height. I love this quote by Mark Twain. Mark Twain once said, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between the lightning and the lightning bug. It's a big difference made by a tiny, tiny little, little word. Some of you may remember when the first MP3 player hit the market 17 years ago. It held a whopping six to 12 songs. <laughs> but it was not until the iPod came out with a, a creative interface, a beautiful, elegant interface, and you could put a thousand songs in your pocket that people were really engaged by the idea of an MP3 player and that those first tiny original models just faded away into nothingness. The technology is the same, but the idea is what elevates it to something new. Now, we're, we're in the information business. We are trying to transfer ideas to other people, to transfer knowledge and wisdom to other people. How can we use technology to enhance that? Technology without creativity behind it, I believe, is incomplete. Take, for instance, the humble slide presentation. <laughs> Just the mention of a PowerPoint is enough to cause eyes to roll back in heads and for fingers to reach for smartphones. You've probably seen it happen if you stood up where I'm standing. You say, I brought along a PowerPoint to show you today, and people go, oh, God. <laughs> it's ironic that the name of the most pervasive software program in the world is, is PowerPoint because most presentations have no power and no point. <laughs> so presentation is key though. Look, which of these meals is gonna be remembered longer? This one you get at McDonald's, served on a generic plastic tray wrapped in paper, or this one it's beautifully arranged, creatively plated on fine china, served on a starched linen tablecloth. Which one of those is going to stick into your memory longer? Well, the second one is. In fact, we're going to go away saying, oh, that restaurant was great, the food was delicious, and you know what? The presentation was beautiful. The presentation was beautiful. When was the last time somebody said that about one of your presentations? <laughs> I'm going to help you get there today. I'm going to tell you some things to do that can help your presentations become beautiful. And therefore, they stick. They are retained. They are engaging to your audience. And they will say, I want more of that. I want to show you some things you can do to make your slide presentations better. Uh, but first, why are so many presentations so lackluster? Why are most of them so boring? I think it has to do with a fundamental problem in the way we think about slide presentations. We usually think of slides as electronic versions of the old flip chart. Now you remember the flip chart, cheap newsprint paper, you endless pages, each one identical. You use them for brainstorming sessions and you write down your brainstorms on them and then you tear them off and stick them on the wall, and what happens after the meeting? They're thrown in the trash. I'm sure we've all gone to visit the Museum of Great Flip Chart Pages. <laughs> no. There's a reason there's not a Museum of Great Flip Chart Pages. The medium is not designed for things of value. It's designed for things to be thrown away. So why would you think of your presentation, your, your info, as something that's not worth any more than ideas for the spring bake sale. I want to challenge you today to, to throw out the flip chart paradigm and instead begin thinking of that blank space as a canvas 
on which you can create something beautiful that touches people and will be remembered for a long time and carries deep meaning. That's a lot to demand from a slide, isn't it? But it's possible to get there. First thing I want to encourage you to do, whatever software you use in your presentations, I want to encourage you to delve into it. Look at every menu item. Look at every transition they give you and see what they do because you can find some surprises in there once you start digging. The problem is we, we like to use it out of the box and we use the templates that come with it and it's the easiest thing to do. That's how all great art is created. <laughs> we do the easiest thing we can. No, delve into the program. Now, the program I use for presentation slides is Keynote. But... Most of what I'm going to show you today can be used with, with PowerPoint and many other presentation software. In Keynote, though, there's a couple of commands that you can use called confetti and blast. What do they do? You set a word and you say, okay, I want to use the confetti effect on it or the blast effect on it. And then when you do your slides, well, that's the confetti and that's the blast. Pretty good description of what they do. That's, that's the uh, default setting. But what happens if you dig into it a little bit and set the timing of those effects to the longest period you can set them for, for 30 seconds or for 60 seconds? Then when you go, the effect is kind of different and it may give you an idea of a new way to do something. It becomes kind of beautiful, kind of elegant. Now you're saying, when would I use a 60 second confetti effect? Well, if you want to make an impression, if you want to be remembered, let me give you an example of how you could use that effect in a creative and artistic way. Look at this sentence. It was the coldest day of the year. Now, I'm going to use that confetti effect, but I'm going to fade in a picture behind it and watch what happens. It becomes art. It becomes beauty. It becomes something that your audience is going to go, whoa, <laughs> I haven't seen that before. And isn't that what we always want them to say? I haven't seen that before. We want to wake them up. One of the first things that you will have to decide when you start doing your slides is what font you're going to use. Fonts, I got my first computer in 1987. And I discovered quickly I was a fontaholic. I started downloading every font I could find, and I made the common beginner's mistake of using 15 or 20 fonts in a one page newsletter. <laughs> yeah. I had to learn not to do that. But there's an amazing array of fonts. Don't just use your default font, don't just use Arial. Uh, look and see what else you can do because there's so many fonts and none of them are perfect for everything, but all of them are perfect for something. Let me give you an example. Well, let's talk about the different kinds of fonts first. You know about sans serif fonts and serif fonts? What's a serif? Well, a serifs are those little, in Texas we call them doohickeys. These little doohickeys that are on the edges of the letters. Now, is there an advantage over a serif font and a sans serif font? I think there is. I think it depends on what the mood you're, you're going for is. For instance, let's say you're looking for a place to invest all those huge sums of money you make in, in a college situation. I thought that would get a laugh, but apparently you're doing better than I thought. You want to invest your money, and, and you're looking for a place to invest your money for the future, and you see a sign that looks like one of these. Which one of these would you pick? How many of you would pick the top one? How many would pick the bottom one? See, the majority says the bottom, and that's the one I would pick, because to me, there's something about a serif font that looks just a little bit more classy than a sans serif font. Now, the problem is, which of these fonts would you decide to invest your money with? <laughs> now, 
Now, does that mean those are bad fonts? No. That just means this is not the purpose for those particular fonts. If you change the business and did something like this, those fonts suddenly become perfect for that use. So before you put a font on a slide, decide, what am I trying to communicate here? What is my message? How do I want it to be received and retained by my audience? Here's a couple of rules I really want you to look hard at. First has to do with using all caps. All caps is, is fine for just a couple of words, but people can read much more quickly when it's uppercase and lowercase. Like in a book, if you tried to read a book that was in all upper caps, you would go crazy. So only use it for emphasis, a headline uh, or your main point, but not filling the page with capital letters. And never, 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 ever use all caps with a script font. <laughs> because if you do, it looks like a pigeon has walked through an ink pad and across your screen. Oh, isn't that horrible? If you have to use a script or calligraphy font, and I caution you not to use them very often, but if you do, please use them mostly in lowercase, or your audience doesn't read them quickly, and we're about communicating. We're about planting ideas in their head. Not all the words on your screen should be the same weight. You're doing a presentation. Speak how to get through to your audience. Well, if you set this as your title slide, everything is the same importance. But really, our title is speak, and our, our subhead is how to get through to it. So don't set them the same size. Vary the size. And in fact, think about even varying the font because the contrast looks better and communicates better. And you can even add touches like adding some color or shadow to your main thought, and suddenly you have something that looks more like a logo, something that was designed, something that's prestigious and has value. Anything you can do that make your slides have more value is worth the seconds it will take you to achieve it. Now, when you put something on the screen, one thing you always have to be aware of is the contrast between your text and your background. I rarely use a white background because it's, it will make your audience snow blind after a while. It's like staring into the headlights of a car. And so I, I will I use black backgrounds a lot with white type on them. I like textured backgrounds. We'll talk about more about those in a moment. But if you're going to use something behind your type, make sure there's enough contrast for your words to be seen easily. This is kind of iffy. How can you make it better? Well, you can, you can put a drop shadow behind it. But if you do, your shadow may be too far apart. And so it just kind of confuses the issue. You can move the shadow closer, and now, oh, suddenly it's starting to jump out from the background a little bit. It'll do even better if you use a, a thicker font, a bolder font, to make it stand out a little bit more. Now I want to show you a trick. Watch what happens within these letters. Now, do you know how that happens? That happens, or it's possible, because these are not letters anymore. They are a shape. Here's how you do. You set your words in your presentation software, or any software. You can do it in Photoshop or whatever. I set these words. Then I take a screenshot of that. Then I take that screenshot, and I bring it into my presentation program. And I use the alpha tool. There's a, a similar tool in PowerPoint. And I go through and I click on each white letter, and it will select everything that is white, and it will blank it out of the picture. And so when I finish doing that, I'm left with what's basically a black sheet of cardboard with a hole in it. And therefore, my background shows through. So I can put whatever I want to behind that. I can bring in a, an image that I find, put my words on the front of it, and then I can set the background to move. And it gives you a very cool effect. Now, you can put anything behind those words. You can, uh, you can use an abstract graphic like that. You can put a photograph behind them. 
You can even set your photograph to gradually move. Or you can even put a video clip or an animated GIF file behind it and get this kind of effect. Those of you in the back, the waterfall is moving. <laughs> so some other things you can do with type. Don't just throw it on the screen and think, OK, I got the words there. I don't need to do anything else. Make something happen. Make your words emphasize your message. For instance, we want to talk about a hiring freeze. What color should your font be to talk about freezing? Some kind of icy color. So I pick a color that I think is icy. It's kind of a nice icy blue. But now how am I going to use that to emphasize this theme? Well, I'm not going to have it fly in like that. I'm going to have it appear on top of the white type I already have there. But I'm going to have it appear with a wipe from top to bottom. And so when I do that, look at this effect. It looks like the letters are freezing. You can do the converse of it too. You're talking about the markets heating up. You use a nice warm orange color and have it start at the bottom. And every time you do something like this, an angel gets its wings. No. <laughs> One brain cell and one student wakes up. And isn't that worth it? Yes, it is. Now, another thing you can do has to do with what's behind your words on screen, the backgrounds that you use. All too often, presenters make the mistake of just using the default. You take the easy way out. Oh, here's a gradient. I'll use this as my background. That's so boring. It shows how little you care about your subject when you do that. Now, don't do this. And even more, don't do this. As I said, it becomes blinding to an audience after a while. If you go to a movie and you stay to the end and they start rolling the credits, you don't see this. You see white letters on a black screen. Why? because you're sitting in a darkened room and you don't want the headlights shining around your face. It's the same with your presentation stuff. Be, be mindful of your audience. Don't abuse their eyeballs. So be always aware, though, of when you're going to use something in the background, what the contrast is going to be. The highest contrast you can get is between black and white. The contrast begins to vary. You wouldn't, you wouldn't set a whole sentence in a medium gray on a black background because it tends to get lost. Well, where do you get cool backgrounds? Folks, they are everywhere. There's this site I want you to be familiar with. It's called Google.com. <laughs> I predict it's going to be big. <laughs> Go on Google and type in anything you can think of texture. I type in rust texture. And when you do this, when you're looking for something to use as a background, look at the, the search tools here, because you want to search for our, the largest images you can get. Otherwise, it may look good when you see it on the Google page like this, but when you blow it up in your presentation, it's going to be all pixelated, and it's not going to look very professional. So find a, an image you like. I, I love rust textures. They're organic. They're random. But there, there's something beautiful about them. And so I will look and I will find a texture like that and I will put it on the screen and then I will think, how could I use this texture? I'm talking to a group of uh, retirees. And I say, okay, are we resting or are we rusting? <laughs> and the background becomes an add-on becomes a bonus feature to my theme. It becomes thematic, the way I use it. Back to Google, anything you can think of, look up cork texture. There's millions of them. Brushed aluminum. Moss. Moss is a beautiful texture. Uh, concrete is a beautiful texture. You can look up wood, or you can even look up a particular kind of wood, like burled walnut. Look. Look at that, and look at that. Those are gorgeous. They would make a beautiful background, especially if you can find some way to relate it to your task. Even, I even Googled algae. Now, unless you're a 
teaching biology or is biology what it would be? <laughs> Unless you're teaching about moss, you may say, why would I ever want to use moss as a background texture? They're not going to know it's moss when you get through with it. You take that texture and then you start messing with it in your presentation software or in Photoshop and you adjust the, the tint and the hue and the contrast and the, the focus and the saturation. And by the time you've tweaked a few knobs and moved things back and forth, you end up with something that looks very different from what you started with. And still, it will be a nice background when you put some words on top of it, and it didn't cost you anything. Or you can buy backgrounds. Or your software program has a lot that come with it, and most of them are terrible. You can go out and find your own, and they don't cost you anything. Here's some things you can Google if you want to find cool textures. This is just off the top of my head. These are all interesting backgrounds. Let's take one in particular, felt. What do you think of when you think of felt? First thing I thought of was green felt on a pool table. So I found a, uh, I found a picture, a texture of green felt. It's a little hard to see in here. And I thought, okay, how could I use that in some way that my background would enhance my meaning? I want to talk to my students and I want to use this green pool table background. Okay, I'm going to talk to them about eight mistakes that can ruin your semester. And then as I get to each one, I'm going to have the one ball come out, then the two ball come out, then the three ball come out. All on a green felt background, and they're going to remember that. Next thing you can do to make your slides more creative has to do with layers. Most people don't even know that you can do this. You can stack things up in layers. The same way Walt Disney discovered he could make animation look three-dimensional with multi-plane photography. You can stack things up, and especially if some of the layers have holes in them, it gives your slides depth. Let me give you an example. Here's a slide from a presentation I did one time. And watch, watch the words. Now, when I did that in a presentation, I didn't even mention it. And six people came up to me afterwards and said, those words went right through those wing rings. How did you do that? I said, you're very observant. How did I do that? I'm going to show you how to do it. I found an image to start with. Just by Googling, I found this image. I went into Photoshop, but you can also do this in your, your presentation software by using that alpha channel, instant alpha. I took out everything you see in red here. I just erased that part of it, so it becomes a transparent part of the image. Then in a layer behind it, that's where I set my type. And then the third layer is the original copy of the picture. So when I stack them up and I animate the letters, they go right through the ring. It's magic. Your audience will say, that is magic. How did you do that? And that's what you want the audience to say. How did you do that? Because they will remember it then. Creative people have a hard time turning off their, their minds. And I did a, a talk to a group of creatives, and I wanted to say that, you know, I usually take one day off a week, and I just go for a drive. In Texas, there are lots of places to just go for a drive. And so I usually take Monday as my day to be off, but I find out even when I'm off, my brain is still on. And in fact, sometimes I've gotten some of my best ideas when I'm supposed to be not doing anything. And so for that talk, I built up the layers. One was this old hand-drawn map I found, hand-lettered map. Here's my type. Boom. There's four layers here. The map. There's a solid blue shape that's transparent that fades the background so I can put my words on top of it. There's the original words, and then there's just the words on, which I've messed with the color so it looks like they glow. I just set the timing, and it looks like a switch has been flipped. And it's very effective at reinforcing your theme. I found a little animated uh, clip of a white surface covered with light bulbs. And none of the bulbs are, are glowing. 
But the camera pans across all these light bulbs, and then it comes to stop on one that is glowing. And I thought, how can I use that? Well, I used it in a talk just like this one. Here's the, the film clip. It's very short, but it pans across the bulbs. But because I know where it's going to end up, I can go ahead and set my type because I know it's going to end right there. And then I can fade the background out. And it's a very effective opening for my presentation. It showed them what I'm talking about, that you can be on even when you're off. One of my presentations is about uh, being creative even as a child, too creative for my own good. And when I was a kid, about eight years old, I loved monsters, but they scared me half to death. And my bed was right next to a window. And many, many nights I would lie in my bed next to that window and, and I would close my eyes very tightly and I would lay there and I would say, I know Frankenstein is at my window. Should I look or should I not look? If, if I look, he'll grab me. But if I don't look, I'll never know if he's really there or not. So I would gather up my courage and I would say, okay, I'm going to look. No, he's not there. But he might have been there. I might have just missed it. He might be there right now. I'm just going to look again. And I never could catch him, but I'm pretty sure he was there part of the time. Well, that's just, that's just three layers there. But it gives a real three-dimensional effect, and it gives me a great point to launch my, my talk from. Here's another way you can do more creative slides, give your slides greater impact. Through the use of frames. You have a an heirloom picture at home of your great-great-grandparents or something, you don't tape that up on the wall with a piece of masking tape, do you? No, it's valuable to us. So we put it in a nice frame. Is your information valuable to you? Do you want it to be valuable to the people you're trying to communicate it to? Think about putting it in a frame so that it shows that it has some value to it. I got the idea to use frames in my presentations from watching TV, from watching one channel in particular. I watch a lot of Turner Classic movies. They have such great graphic design on there. And I noticed when they would show an old uh, movie trailer, they wouldn't just fill up the screen with it. They would show it like inside a billboard. They would have an old picture of a highway with a billboard. And inside the billboard, that's where the, the trailer would show, and I thought, I can use that some way. So when I was doing a talk on lessons learned from the Wizard of Oz, I get to speak about some of the coolest stuff. <laughs> lessons learned from the Wizard of Oz. I thought, okay, I'm going to do a frame for this. Well, I need yellow bricks. I couldn't really find good yellow bricks, but I could find plenty of red bricks. And it's a simple matter to take those into Photoshop and change the color of them. And then I erase most of them, leaving a big hole in the middle. I put the title of my presentation down there, and now I have a themed frame, and whatever I put up there is going to be tied together by being within that frame. Now, you know when you do a presentation, your students are going to be taking pictures of your screen. And when they do that, wouldn't it be great if every picture they take has the theme on it? has some bit of information they need on it. You can make a frame out of anything. I found this image. I thought, I'm going to make a frame out of that. I erased almost all of the M&Ms. I even found a font that looks like M&Ms. What can you do with that? Well, media and marketing, money and management, me and Martha, <laughs> whatever you want to. But it ties everything together. And I have done this presentation on media and marketing, and people have come in to see it, and on each table, on each chair, there was a little fun-sized pack of M&Ms. You think they will remember that? I guarantee they will remember that. If, talking, if I'm talking to a group of physicians, I found clip art of a medicine bottle, just copied and pasted it around, came up with a frame, and so now I can talk to them and show them whatever they want to see, but the, everything is tied together by a frame. If you're talking about being creative, don't use Comic Sans for your font. 
Use something that looks creative and then frame it in a creative way, in a way a creative person would frame it. See, it takes on interest. It takes on value. It says, I care about this information. Therefore, I want you to care about this information too. You can even make your own theme, your own frame. I'm a professional speaker. My name is Mike. My website is isthismikeon.com. I say that every speaker in the world advertises my website at one time or another because every one of them says that. Is this mic on? Dot com. <laughs> That's the name of my website. That's my name. My branding, my color scheme on my website, on my business card, on my body, I like red, black, and white. So I decided to make a frame for myself. First thing I found was this texture, which is like an old microphone. I put a red gradient over it from left to right. Then I put my information on there. I put a little shadow where I'm going to appear. And then I built a little frame just out of four graded, gradient rectangles, and I cut out the stuff under that frame. Now, I've got a custom frame here, and every slide I show is going to have my name and my website on it, and they are never going to forget who I am. And all those people who take pictures of my slides and put them on Twitter or Facebook, free advertising. See, it's possible to make your slides work for you, not just be passive lumps on a screen. They can add to your presentation. All right. Oh, here's a cool way to use frames. You want to use a video clip? Yeah, you could just show it in a browser frame or something like that. Look at this. Now, I know a lot of you want to watch this film. Uh, how many layers are in this slide? Five. That's right. There are five layers. There are two TVs, one of them with a screen, the other with the screen cut out. But that second one only appears after the first one drops in, so you don't even know it's there. But that gives me a layer behind which I can put that video image. So then I use a different texture for the table, one for the wallpaper, and then I have the, the film appear behind the first TV screen. It's framed, and it focuses the audience's attention exactly where I want it to be. Now, as I structure this talk, I start with the, the simple stuff like fonts, and then I get into the really cool stuff. This is a really cool part. This is one of my favorite parts because I don't know anybody who does this kind of stuff. <laughs> Did you miss it? Were you looking down? Some of you missed it. Let me go back. Because this section has to do with using animated GIFs. I really want to call them GIFs. But last year, the guy who invented it said, no, I pronounce it GIF, in spite of the fact that it stands for graphic image file or something like that. Graphic should have a G, but he said J. So using GIF files. Now, what's a GIF file? You see them all the time. They're, they're just little repetitive little animated things. This is just an example. Now, unless you're talking about the mating habits of parakeets, you probably wouldn't want to use this one. But there are some amazingly cool GIFs that, that you can use in very creative ways. For instance, I came across this one one day a couple of years ago. It's a guy walking on a country road, but you notice what's happening? He's not getting any closer. He's not going anywhere. Oh, it looks like he's making progress, but he's really not. Well, that'll preach right there. That'll, that's the perfect kind of image to use to say, are you just going through the motions? Or are you actually making progress? And it adds a thematic element that will stick in your audience's head. I found this little image of a, a campfire. And it's a small image, but I matched the background to it. And so then I set the words of type in three different colors of orange, gave them some shadow. 
and it gives them depth. It looks like the words are different distances away from the fire. I found this beautiful GIF file of a yin and yang. Isn't that gorgeous? The animation of it is gorgeous, but I also thought the color choice was beautiful, and I thought, what could I use that for? Well, a message about uh, cooperation, working together. And so I picked out a nice, classy-looking font. I sampled the colors from these yin and yang to match the type, and I set my type in there. And this is my title screen for that program. Now, which is going to stick? This one or this one? The one that you expend some creativity on is always going to stick. Now, great things about GIF files, most of them are you can set to repeat over and over again, and you can use them to replace letters in your type. And suddenly what was just a word becomes something more dynamic. I just come across these all the time. When I do, I just drag it off onto my desktop. I have a file of GIF files. And then when I have to talk about something, I'll go through each one and I'll say, ooh, that would be good for this. I found this, this GIF and I thought, what could I use that for? What does that say to you? Links being formed. Connecting. Uh, we're all about connecting today. We're all about building our networks. So I thought, okay, connecting, that's a a good theme. And so how would I use this in a title slide? I would talk about forming solid connections. Now look, that's beautiful. That's gorgeous. And it looks like a million dollars and it cost me nothing. Just a little bit of time and a little bit of thought. Sometimes I find GIFs and I don't know what to do with them. This one. It does this over and over and over. And it took me a while to think of how I would use that. But I finally came up with a way to do it. Now, why did I use red letters? Because if I'd used either white or black, they would have been blanked out part of the time by the background image. Most GIF files tend to be round. I found this one, it was very unusual. And so I thought, okay, how can I use that in a title that would be interesting? That's a logo. That's value. That's the kind of stuff people pay big bucks to graphic designers and creative consultants to come up with. And all you have to do is think about it and put it together. It's pretty easy. Now, I want to show you how I, I built this one. The background has nothing to do with this. Here's the original GIF file. All it does is drench this square with black paint and then with white paint. So how can I use that? It, it may sit in my file for a year or two before I come up with a use for it. But then I had an idea. So I set these words in contrasting type, and then I move them on top of the GIF file. And so now I want to talk about how do you make the grade when things are bad or when things are good. Now, I didn't have to animate that. I found it, but it, it gives my presentation animation. It gives it value. Here's one of the most unusual GIFs that I've found and used. That's all it does, and it'll do it forever. And how can I use it? Well, first, I'm going to match the background to fill out my slide so it's not just sitting there in a little box, and then I'm going to sample the colors of the little spheres that are going around there, and I'm going to use that because, to me, what this GIF represents is a routine, something that happens over and over again. So you see I've matched some of the colors and the letters to the balls that are going around and around. But the problem with the routine, after you've been in it for a while, it becomes a rut. Well, what do you do when your routine turns into a rut? Well, the first thing you do is to stop, and then you can address the truth of the matter. Boom! Bam! Kicked it up a notch. 
Another very cool thing you can do, and you will be outstanding in your field if you do this, and you will be all alone until more people hear me speak, <laughs> is to interact with the screen. You've got this huge thing standing beside you, and yet most of the time we just ignore it. And there are things you can do with it that are funny, that are involving, that are engaging. For instance, CSUN wants you to know how to be more creative in using technology. And so they thought, who can we find that is the most creative person to do this task? <laughs> oh, me. Well, that's a very Monty Python-esque thing to do. But it, it gets a laugh. It breaks the ice. It makes a point, and it will stick in their minds. Did you know if you take a black screen and you put a white circle on it, it is exactly like a spotlight. You want to emphasize something? Have a white circle come up on a black screen and stand in it. It's like a literal spotlight shining on you, and all of a sudden you are the focus of everything. Well, how else can you use layers? I talked to a group of salespeople one time. The problem is always identifying the real problem. And so I let them read this this statement, we've lost more sales lately by making little errors. And then I walked up to the screen and I'm... But let's talk about what really matters. I have heard audiences gasp when I do things like that because they've never seen anybody do it. And therefore, they're gonna remember it. My major subject, the thing I talk about more than anything else is creativity. And I talk about how when I was a child, I watched The Wizard of Oz. When I was a child, it was before Netflix streaming. <laughs> it was before DVDs. It was before VHS tapes at Blockbuster. The only way you could see it when I was a kid was to wait once a year and watch it on CBS. And they would show it on a Sunday night. And so I would watch that movie and just wait. And Dorothy, when that house would land and she would open the door and she was in Munchkin land, I thought it was the most wonderful thing I'd ever seen. But you know what? We had a black and white TV. I didn't even realize when she opened the door, Technicolor started there. I still thought it was amazing, but I realized that's a life lesson. Many, many people go through life and they think, well, I have my ups, I have my downs, but life is pretty good. What if you're just seeing the black and white version and there's Technicolor? And when I do that, I use this image and I say, when I saw Dorothy and her friends get that glimpse of the Emerald City across the poppy field, I thought it was the most glorious thing I'd ever seen. It was beautiful. I want to go there. And I didn't even realize, though, that I wasn't seeing the Technicolor version. There again, the audience goes crazy when you do stuff like that. I see some of you making mental notes. At the end of that talk on creativity, I, I say most people go through life doing this. We're spectators at our own life. We sit in a bleacher saying, you know, I thought it'd be more interesting than this. And that's a shame because we're not supposed to just go through life reacting to what happens. We're supposed to go through life doing this. Creating the life we want to have. So you're sitting there with your mouth open, Samantha. <laughs> All that is, that's a simple effect. It's just timing and having one of these. But you go through life creating the life you want to have. So if you want something that's more technicolor, you just go through and, and make it that way and make your own artistic vision for your life. Now this combines everything I've told you about. Layering, GIFs, uh, interaction with the screen. And there's a reason I do it, because it makes a point. Now, this is an image I found, and I use it when I talk to people who, who aren't sure how to proceed with their life. Uh, all of us have some point in our life where we've suffered. We've had some kind of setback. We've had something that's knocked us back uh, on our bottom, and we don't know what to do. But the difference is some people get over it and use it to grow from, and some people just whine about it for the rest of your life. So this, this x-ray has an obvious break in this finger right here. 
And so a lot of people go through their life saying, oh, my finger hurts, I can't do anything. I can't, I'll never play the violin again. I can't do any heavy lifting. Look, my finger hurts, feel sorry for me. But then there are the people who decide, no. <laughs> They're going to get beyond that. And instead, that setback, that dramatic moment in their life is going to become the one thing that steps them to a higher plane. It, that one thing that becomes a, a keyhole or even a doorway into the place they really want to be. Now that's just layering and timing. But man, does it make a point. So these are all things that you can do to make better slides. But now I want to get down to the nitty gritty. I was sent two actual slide presentations from this school. <laughs> and so I picked out a few slides from one of them, one on leadership, and I want to show you, here's what I would do if I was doing that slide deck. The first slide I picked out to work on looked like this. Now, my friends, a slide like this can induce narcolepsy, <laughs> depression, and a general questioning of life choices. <laughs> Don't show them a wall of text. Show them a little block of text and teach them how to build the dang wall. That's quotable right there. Tweet that. <laughs> Don't show them a wall of text. Show them a block and teach them how to build the wall. So, what would I do if I wanted to convey this exact same information, but in a way that's pleasant to look at and will be memorable, memorable to them? Well, first I'm going to find an image, and then I'm going to incorporate the colors of that image into the letters I've got up here in the word leadership, and then I'm going to introduce the points one at a time, and I'm going to keep that color coding And see, this way you can go through and spend as much time you want to on each point. You're going to cover them all anyway. You don't have to put them all on the screen at, some time, at the same time. Slides are cheap. <laughs> Use five instead of one. And uh, one more. And then you want to give them a little summary at the end of it before you move on to the next slide? Here's all five points. So that's one slide. Then I came across this slide. Now, information-wise, what's the most important thing in this slide? The most important thing is this quote. But in this slide, it's the third most prominent thing. So what would I do if I wanted to make this slide be retained by my audience? I would completely rethink how I'd do it. I don't want Jack floating in a little box over by the side. I want him to be part of a whole image. And then I'm going to say, here's who he is. Here's what he's talking about. Oh, here's our quote. Now it is the focus. See, now it looks like a billboard. Now it looks like a magazine ad. It does not look like a PowerPoint presentation. And that is my goal. Then I came across this slide. The big five personality traits. And I was, I was puzzled by this because obviously somebody had gone to the trouble of thinking of this mnemonic device, O-C-E-A-N. But they did nothing with that on the slide. Well, I'm going to do everything with that on the slide because I want them to remember ocean. And then I want them to remember what each of those letters stand for. So I'm going to use the ocean. And then when it's time, I'm going to have each one of these letters bubble up and say, now we're going to talk about openness. And now we're going to talk about conscientiousness. And see, when you do it this way, they can't wait to see what the next one is. If you throw it all out there at once, they go, okay. Tease them. Show them previews of what you're going to show up. Well, that seems to have struck a nerve. I didn't come up with them. 
Uh, and then finally, I found uh, this slide. Now, what's the problem with this slide? There's no prioritization. Everything has the same weight. Every word is about as important as every other word on the slide. Now, they found a nice clip art image of planes flying in formation to illustrate the concept of a leader. And I have no qualm with that, but again, it's set over here in a little box, and we don't know what's most important. What's least important here? Chapter 14 is least important. We don't need to know that. We need to know we're talking about leadership, and here are our objectives. So here's the way I would do that. Now, I'm, I'm not going to ignore their airplanes. I'm going to bring in the planes, and then I'm going to bring in the points, and the leader plane points right at the important things I want to say. The information is the same. The presentation is what's different. Finally, I just want to remind you, you're not in the technology department. You're in the information technology department. And I think these words are in the right order of priority. We're about information. The technology is our tool to convey it. And I want you to know, I want you to realize the, the data, the knowledge, the concepts, the wisdom that you want to convey were not discovered by people who said, I'm just going to do it the way everybody else has always done it. They didn't do it that way. Why are you doing it that way? Make your slides echo your voice. Make them something that is unique to you. You have the technology. Concentrate on how you can best use it to convey the information. You have all the power you need. You just need to be reminded sometime, what's the point? And how can I sharpen it? Thank you for your attention today. If you have any questions or comments, I would be happy to address them with you. I must have covered it all. Oh, yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I enjoyed your presentation. I was wondering, you have a lot of red in your, um, in your presentations, and... Um, there's a lot of people who have red and green color blindness, mm. and I'm wondering whether you've ever looked at what this would look to a colorblind person. No, I have not. That's an interesting point. <laughs> I will do that. Yes. You've often said you've found the images. Do you, do you have a way of checking whether they're public domain and whether yes. they're, they're available uh, to be used? On your Google search, there is a, a drop-down menu that has information about the rights. And some people will say, here are rights you can use for educational purposes. Here are rights that you must pay for. I, I either use things that are royalty-free, or sometimes I will pay for an image if it's a particular good image that I want to use. Uh, things like GIF files hardly ever have attribution attached to them. Now, that's beginning to change, and in the future, uh, that will probably become more commercial, that people will say, if you want to use this, you need to pay for it. And I don't, I don't have a problem with paying for the things I use if I can find out who I'm supposed to pay for them, but sometimes it's hard to do. Yeah. I do definitely believe in compensating artists who create things when I can find out who they are. Anyone else? Yes. Um, I see it a lot of times um, when you create something on like a Mac computer and then you put it in a PC and that the format doesn't transfer over or when you share it online and it just doesn't look the same and you, you created all the effects and all that and it's just lost. Do you, what do you use for that? Like do you use a specific software or website that you could upload your I, I can export things to PowerPoint, but like you say, some of the transitions will not transfer over. So it depends on the audience I, that is going to have the finished product. If they're all PowerPoint only, 
then I will not put effects in there that I know will not carry over. If, if needed, if it, I'm sorry, if need be, I can just export the whole presentation as a video file and they can watch it that way if they want to really get the full effect of all the things I'm doing. Yeah, unfortunately, not everything is uh, compatible. Really enjoyed what you presented today. How about how much time do you spend on each it really, it really varies a lot. You know, a slide that just has six words of text is not going to take me as long as a concept that I want to include animation or something. In. Uh, it, it really varies. Now, I do some of this for clients on a client basis, and I always charge them, or I always estimate, an hour per slide, but it doesn't usually take me an hour. But now, some of the slides I showed you may take me two hours or more to do for something that's on screen for 10 seconds. But I happen to think the effect is worth it, you know? It's like they can make an Avengers movie for $600, but you wouldn't want to watch it. <laughs> yes? Oh, hello. What about practice, especially the screen interactions? Oh, practice is good. And the first thing I did when I got in here today was to see where the screens were, how big they were, how high they were. Uh, that thing with the pointing finger, when I walked in here today, it was pointing the other direction. But I knew I wanted to stand right here, so I had to just go into that slide and flip it around so that it would, it would be the right thing. But sometimes I will have to go in and tweak something. The, the word I did, the uh, reacting, turning into creating, uh, I've had to do it sometimes where the screen is above my head and I have to just reach up to barely reach it, so I'll move those words way down to the bottom. But practice is great, but you also got to practice once you get to the venue that you're going to present in. But timing, the timing part, you can practice just on your laptop, you know, with adjusting timing. But it makes all the difference in the world when the timing is right. It is magical. All right. I think we're good. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Mike. I won't get to just put text on my uh, slides anymore. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming. Can we just thank all of our speakers one more time, Samantha and uh, everyone from that group. And again, want to thank all of our vendors for being here as well. Please uh, take some time to, to visit the ones you haven't got to yet. Um, they will be around for a good while longer. Um, just want to thank every single one of them. We've got HP, SHI, Microsoft, uh, Ma uh, Apple, Linda, Dell. Thank you all of you for coming. Um, and just look in the next, uh, in the coming days for a survey about the event. We want to make sure we get your feedback. So when you see it, please take a few minutes and just uh, tell us how it was so that uh, 2016 will be um, very good. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>